Welcome. Today we're going to learn a bit about um, um, Shiny, which is a package for making interactive web uh, applications from R. Um, and we're just really just going to scratch the surface because um, this is a very big world. There's a lot of packages related to Shiny. Um, and um, can even end up like doing JavaScript code with Shiny. Um, um, so going beyond R. Uh, but let's just get a bit started. So on this Google Doc here, I put a couple of links. Um, so the plan today is just to walk a little bit through some of the resources for Shiny. Then they have a great example that we can um, walk through and like do um, some exercises if you have the package installed. So if you can, in the meantime, make sure you install it. Um, um, and then at the end of it, I have uh, a few links to Shiny apps I've made over the years. Um, some of them are simpler than others. Um, cool. So the main, the main website for Shiny currently is uh, shiny at uh, rstudio.com. Um, um, I mean, and I say that because uh, there's a new book that is in the works um, that is going to explain how to master Shiny. Um, so let me see if I can reload this. If it works, cool, it's working now. Okay, so the idea is that um, a lot of times you might want to um, interactively explore your data. Um, and so this can be really useful even if it's just for yourself. Um, because maybe you have a couple like um, 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 a, a couple of variables of interest that you want to you know see and make a new plot and uh, for example you might choose be choosing the variable uh, for coloring a PC1 versus PC2 plot uh, maybe you just want to explore things or let's say you're interacting with other people and at that point then you want to communicate um, results from your analysis um, and so uh, you can even you can make like really professionally looking uh, websites using shiny and interactive uh, websites. Um, so um, if you want to go that full route, you might end up like using CSS and Git and JavaScript. Um, but um, um, for a lot of the things we will do, we don't need that much. We just need like something that uh, will show our data to our collaborators or to ourselves. Um, and that uh, we can play around a little bit with. Um, how does it actually look? The idea is that um, if you, you've been using R for a while, you don't need to learn all these web um, technologies. Um, and, um, and you might just need to you know, learn a little bit more of uh, this R syntax from the shiny R package. Um, and so, the way this is done is like oh, here on the left side, we can see an interactive, um, uh, an interactive website that um, it has like it has a couple like a trend index option, and I can change it and say like instead of the default that was travel, I can change it to education, and that automatically updated the plot below it. Um, I can also give it a date range, so instead of January two thousand seven to July thirty first. 2017, maybe I want it only until like uh, July 1st. Um, you have some options here um, that um, um, conditionally show up more information. Um, we can fit this bulleted line, um, um, depending how much we smooth it, uh, is how uh, rag this line looks like. Um, and so, um, this is maybe something that you want to generate for you, for yourself or, or for your collaborators. How it's actually made. So um, there's gonna be a couple of pieces on the shiny side. There's like several functions. Some of them are input functions. So they have the, um, um, shiny uses camel case. So that means um, lower, uh, case at the beginning and then uh, capitalize um, the first letter of the second word or the third word of the function. Um, and it uses uh, suffixes instead of prefixes. So 
and there's a lot of functions that end with the word input. Um, um, so like here there's a, a, a select type of input. There's another uh, input for uh, the type date range. Um, and all the, all the types of inputs have a paired function. So for every um, function that has something that ends with input, there's actually an output. So there's select output. Sorry, um, I said that incorrectly. Um, uh, sorry, there's a lot of input functions and there's also a lot of output functions. There's actually not a select output function. I, I, I messed up that part. Um, so for the output functions here, we're actually showing uh, on this section, we're showing a plot. Um, um, and we are also showing some text below. So this is information about the education that I changed. If I select instead of education, let's say advertising, the text will now say that this is advertising data. Um, so the text actually changed. Um, if I zoom out a little bit, maybe we can see it on real, on real time. I'm gonna go and select education again, and you can see that the text also changed, right? So that's this text output over here on the right side. Um, um, so those are the types of functions that we'll use. Now, sometimes we wanna also include um, HTML code. So that's actually like the code for making a website. And for that, we might use then the tags um, object inside um, our output. So here there's, um, uh, I need to move zoom around. Um, so here we have like, we're introducing a link. So that's the um, href, that's a type of tag. They're using HTML for a hyperlink reference, href. Um, um, and you can, so this is like a little bit glimp, a, a little like teaser of how like you can start making things a bit more complicated um, going beyond R. Now we go back to the R side. Um, we go back to our select input. There's uh, um, all the input and output functions have an ID argument. So the input functions have something called input ID. The output functions have something called output ID. Now this is something you choose as a programmer when you're making your app. And it can be, uh, I recommend to use more uh, descriptive type, uh, like uh, names here, because um, if you use a very general name, like type in this case, it's gonna make your life a little bit more complicated later. You're gonna have to remember um, uh, what actually the word type meant, right? Um, so, because <clears throat> um, internally in our code, we, we will reference this, uh, these IDs. Um, so, you know, this one, you can say, okay, I, I can, just from looking at the ID, I understand that this is a plot, because it says line plot. And I know that it's like something has to do with lines, but if you have a lot larger app, you might have like line plot one, two, three, four, and those names are not gonna be as useful, right? So, the, so I would treat the IDs basically how you treat object names in R. So I will try to make them as descriptive as possible. Now, um, each of the inputs has like a couple like arguments, like this one has like, what is the text that is showing? What are, what are the choices that are uh, uh, shown? Um, okay, what is the option that is selected by default? If you reload the website, it's gonna be, uh, travel is gonna be the one that is uh, loaded by default, um, things like that. Now, that's the backbone of this. Let's go a bit into the details. So you can make a little R script here. This, uh, this is app.r that actually contains everything for making uh, the, the Shiny app that we see on the left. You'll see that there's, there's a lot more stuff going on. Um, and so instead of this more complicated example, we'll start a bit more from the basics. Um, but uh, if, I, if you copy paste all this code into R, then you can actually run it. Uh, um, you can run this same app that we see on the left. You can run it on your computer. Um, so that's a bit of the overview of, of what Shiny is. Um, the Shiny website, uh, if I scroll further, let me zoom out. Um, 
if I scroll to the top, there's this green button, sorry, to the middle, there's a green button that says get started. Um, and so this actually, I actually haven't seen this video, but uh, it's a two hour and a half video. <laughs> um, was it two minutes? No, it's two hours. <laughs> um, and so this is a much more uh, detailed video. Um, um, if you want to like fully get into Shiny, but um, uh, you know, if people learn different ways. I actually um, prefer to jump sometimes to the documentation and start playing with examples. So um, one way you can do that, actually this website has something called the gallery on the top. Um, and that's the next link that I have on, the, on this Google Doc, the gallery. So this gallery is quite uh, fun because they showcase some like working examples of uh, shiny apps. Um, um, and so this is kind of like the same thing I mentioned when we looked at Gplot2, where uh, in that case, I recommended looking at the website or the book and just finding quickly something that looks similar to what you want to build. And then, then from there, you can customize it. So one of them is actually the IC uh, Shiny app, which is the Interactive Summarized Experiment Explorer, which won an award. Um, this one is a very complicated Shiny app, but um, to code, to use is really easy, but to code is actually a complicated one. Um, but uh, I mean, you can see like a lot of um, different types of things people have made. <laughs> There's one about Pokemon. Uh, and there's actually then uh, demos or uh, simpler examples than those that you saw above. So for example, here there's one about like uh, using k-means clustering um, on some data or one about making a work lab or like how to actually include like a map on your, on your shiny website. Um, and so um, once you start like, you know, once you get interested in building one of these apps, um, uh, it's useful to come back to the gallery and double check like, okay, like let's see this example for a timer or for an action. Uh, like all these demos are quite useful for understanding how to actually build a shiny app based on what your needs are. So I recommend this gallery quite a bit. Um, but next, um, on the top, there's also something called articles. So this, I actually use it a lot whenever I'm making a shiny app because um, um, these articles, they, uh, oh, sorry, the reference actually is the one I used, but uh, did I change? Mm. Oh, well, um, I haven't looked at this in a bit, but um, um, let's look at one of them. So, um, yeah, okay. So yeah, I do look quite a bit at this because this is kind of like the documentation and it's a lot more useful sometimes than the R package help for the Shiny uh, package. So, um, so I just wanted everyone to be aware of this, uh, you know, what is available on this um, uh, shiny.rstudio.com website um, uh, because a lot of this information can be quite useful later on for, um, for understanding how the multiple functions from the Shiny package work together. Um, so one of the articles here is about the basics of a Shiny app. Um, so here there's a Hello Shiny example. And actually the Shiny package has uh, a function called run example. So if I say like uh, run hello and copy that into my R session where I already loaded the Shiny package. Um, here it's uh, making a Shiny app on my computer with data that I have that maybe other people don't have. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a information about uh, the old faithful um, um, gazer at Yellowstone. Um, and uh, it's making, it's just a histogram, but like we can change the parameter, which is the number of of boxes or bins that we have in this in this histogram, so I can have just five or have like up to fifty, um, um, uh, just to see the distribution of the waiting time for the next eruption. 
So how was this actually made? So this example is quite fun because it includes the code for making the app below. So um, um, like I could copy all of it. I right click copy um, and paste it into my R session if you would want to look into it a bit more slowly. Um, so let's see how this um, app was made, this example. So, well, first you need to load Shiny. Um, otherwise, none of these works. Next, you need to uh, select the type of website that you want uh, um, to create. One of them is called a fluid page. And um, here we're defining something called the UI or user interface. And so we're gonna say like, okay, like what, what is the structure of our Shiny app? We're gonna have a title called Hello Shiny. So for that, we're gonna use the title panel. Then we wanna have something on the side with like options that you can choose. So that's gonna be the sidebar layout. Um, and we actually wanna have um, some options. So for that, we're gonna have this sidebar panel. And really right now, we only have one input that we want from the users. And uh, that's gonna be the number of bins or a histogram. And so um, we want the user to, to be able to slide through this input. So we're gonna use the slider input. Now, remember that the input ID, I told you should be, I recommend something quite a specific. So this bins um, is quite on a specific, right? It's like, what is, you know, you see that ID somewhere, it's like, okay, what I was referring to. So um, I might, I'm gonna change this one. Just say histogram bins, um, make it be more, more specific. My input ID. Um, then this is the text for the users to choose. So here I'm gonna say, like, okay, what is the number of bins that we want? And we can set a minimum, a maximum, and a default value. Um, so that's all the all the all the sidebar inputs. And next we want to have um, some outputs. And so for that, we're gonna define a main panel, so the main section of our website where things are displayed. And in our case, we only have one plot. And so that's gonna be, we're gonna use the plot output function. And um, uh, something happened, getting notifications, okay. And so now we choose an output ID for uh, our plot. So here they just call it this plot, which um, you need to remember what, this is here short for distribution. So um, I'm gonna change the ID, eruption, histogram, um, cause I want my name to be more specific than the one that they have. Why do I want a specific name? So that later on I can easily uh, search and find. If I try to search bins, like it shows up in a lot of places, right? And like, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. Um, so that's why I'm here I'm changing the names to be more uh, specific. So that's the UI side. Uh, that's a user interface. Now we need to define a function called the server function that uh, this server function, unlike other functions that we made before, always has as arguments input, output, and like you could even add the session arguments. Um, these are not arguments that you should change. These are uh, default arguments for Shiny to work. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, um, that's a bit more advanced, so we'll leave it. Um, we'll just say that that's how Shiny works for now. Okay, so now we actually, uh, we're like, now that we have a, our website and how it looks, we need to actually work with what the data uh, that the user provides. And so, um, First of all, there's, we're going to work with a data set um, called Faithful. Uh, this is one of the example data sets in R. Um, um, and, uh, and like in a more complicated example, you might be you know, downloading your own data and things like that. Or uh, the user might be uploading their data to the website. Uh, so this uh, uh, Faithful uh, data frame has information about the eruptions and the waiting time. So we're just gonna use the waiting time really for our example. And here that we're defining it as X. Now, you can see here why I changed the bin's uh, name before, the ID before, because we're creating, we're using something from the input. Um, and so um, 
the ID that we provided before on our slider input, that ID, if I want to refer to whatever value the user provides from the slider input, I'm going to have to use that input ID. Um, and so I'll go further below and I will use input dollar sign the input ID. So it initially was bins. I changed it to histogram bins just to make it more specific. Why did I make that more specific? Because um, here we're creating an R object called bins and that's not the same thing as our input ID from before, right? Um, so just to make it easier to separate mentally what are the different pieces of our Shiny app, I think it's best to use different input IDs and output IDs than the ones we use for our R objects, right? Um, okay, so, um, so for our plot, we're gonna use the data from the weighting. We're gonna create a set of, of of bins based on the minimum and maximum. Um, and we're gonna use whatever input the user provide as a number of bins. And we're gonna add one because you have to have like, um, you, want a five, you wanna have five different boxes. That is, that is actually six different cuts, right? Um, so you have you know one where it begins, two here in the middle between my two fingers, three, four, five, and then after the last finger, six, right? To get the six um, little uh, to get five boxes, you need six um, endpoints. Um, so we're going to make our histogram using the his function from R, um, um, using our bins. We're choosing some colors and stuff, and all of this code you'll notice all of this R code is inside a function called render plot. Um, so for every type of this is where actually the, uh, what I wanted to say earlier that I made a mistake on uh, is uh, now actually matches. For every type of output, so we're using the plot output. So if, uh, there's actually a render function. So if we're rendering, a, if we want to have a, a plot as the output, we need to use a render plot function from the Shiny package. The way, is it, the way these functions are uh, specified is that you open the parentheses and then you open curly brackets. And inside of the curly brackets, you can have as many lines of R code as you want. Um, now, all of that code is going to be evaluated on the, your R uh, session um, on, on real time, whenever the user changes something. And that piece of code, and in this case, is making a little figure. So Shiny that knows how to treat that piece of figure and like put it into the website. Um, all of that is run by the render plot um, uh, will be reactive. That's a term that is used quite a bit in, in the shiny um, this, uh, this, uh, 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 manual. Um, and by reactive, it means that like whenever the users the user changes something, your code is going to react. So it's going to run at that point. It's going to react to whatever the user change. Um, and so. In order for the UI to know, you know, where does this plot go to, you need to save it into the output object, dollar sign, the output ID. So I actually, initially it was um, this plot and I changed it to the eruption underscore histogram. So I'm gonna change that over here too. Um, um, and so um, now, that we have the user side and the server side. So whatever R is doing and whatever the website looks like, now we can actually run our Shiny app. So I'm gonna like select all this code and execute it. And um, here we go. We have our Shiny app um, where uh, the user itself doesn't know that this input is a slider input. It doesn't know that the ID is like um, uh, histogram underscore bins. Uh, they just see the plot, right? And that's all they care about at this point, right? Um, um, and so that's our first Shiny app. Um, cool. So um, I just explained in you know, my way of explaining a lot of what is here and this basics article for the first Shiny app. 
Um, then it's more, you know, the, then it gets more and more complicated. <laughs> um, there's more and more examples. So um, let me go and change from that website to the mastering-shiny.org website. What is this website? Well, if we go to the welcome site, this is a new book being written by uh, Hadwig Wickren uh, on Mastering Shiny. So a lot of you might know uh, Hadley's name. He's the author of ggplot2. Um, and, uh, but he's not the author of Shiny. The author of Shiny is uh, Zhou Cheng. And so uh, uh, this book that Hadley wrote, he wrote it to actually understand what Joe did and like the rest of the Shiny team. So he wanted to become really good at Shiny as a user and then created this book so that other people could, um, uh, could also understand uh, the documentation um, like he did. Um, um, and I mean, you could actually buy it from O'Reilly Media if you wanted to, or you, you can access it, access it on this website. Um, so um, here it says like, okay, that's, there's a different take on, on creating your first app. Um, so the very, very basic app here is one that has a fluid page for how the website looks like, and it's only defining something there, a little piece of text, um, and there's no actual uh, server function. Uh, um, um, like the server function is like, it's empty. It just says input output session. Um, so if I, if we copy that and just execute it. So let me add where this is coming from to this, uh, to my R session. Um, so if I just run that, we get a bare bones shiny app website, which all it says, hello world. That's all it does, right? There's actually no way of interacting. Um, but um, uh, from our studio, we can actually see that it's um, being, um, 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 it's being served uh, to our browser on our local host address, which is 127.0.0.1 on a specific port. And, uh, I could open it in our studio, sorry, in my, um, from our studio, I can open it in my, in my browser. And like I can see here, hello world on the top left. Okay. Um, so that's our very first, very, very first shiny app. Um, um, so it's making all the HTML and everything for us. What is actually uh, happening is that uh, uh, it's, um, 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 uh, we're running R at the same time. And you can see here in my R console, it says it's listening on that address, right? So my R session right now is 100% dedicated to my Shiny app. The R session has to be run, running all the time for my Shiny app to work, right? Um, so if I press escape, I'll cancel that and kill the, you know, liberate my R session, right? Um, so we can use it. <clears throat> right. Um, so let's add some controls to our Shiny app. Um, so let's make it a bit more complicated. So I'm actually gonna make this into a new tab. Um, um, let me go back to the beginning, sorry, of this exercise. Let's copy that code, paste it. Um, uh, I'm gonna work on my desktop, call it app.r. Um, why did I do that? Call it app.r now on our studio. It recognizes that we're working on a shiny app. On the top right side, I can click run app. And that will, you know, run my app. And we can see it. And if um, you know if it works, that's cool. 
And right now, if I want to continue developing, so I'm going to close it. And that actually kills um, the session here. Um, so we're going to add some, we're going to make our UI, our user interface, a bit more complicated. So we're going to copy this, copy and paste this piece of code. Um, and we want, we're going to replace the last two to four of the user interface. Um, so what are we doing? We're adding an input uh, for, uh, that we're going to call a data set. That's the ID. If you look at the arguments for select input, the first argument is the input ID. We're going to have a text output called summary <coughs> and a table output called table. So I'm just going to save this and run the app. And now we see we have on the top here the label argument of the select input specifies the text for that input. Um, and then we, we call the data set. The options for it, the choices are um, the options from the data sets package. <coughs> um, so these are all the example data sets that are included in. Um, in R, um, you can see like one of them is this Iris data set that I've mentioned before that like uh, people are moving away from in the R community because of um, how basically the person who made it was a racist. Um, <coughs> and we don't see the Penguins data set yet, but I bet that the next, in the uh, next R version will see Penguins available. Um, anyway, there's a lot of data sets we can use, right? And that's it. Nothing else is happening. Why is that? Because, I mean, as a user, here I'm changing the value of the input um, data set. But on the server side, we're not doing anything yet, right? We're not calculating anything. We're, we're not reacting to whatever the user is doing. So now um, I'm going to cancel that, go back, and let's copy some um, behavior to, um, to our Shiny app. So I'm going to copy and replace the, the server code. So line seven and eight, I'll replace them. So we still have our function called server that takes us argument input, output, and session. But now it has more pieces to it. Now it has an output with the ID summary. And that actually matches our um, text output from line number four. It has an output called table, which actually matches the, the ID from our um, 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 table output on line five. Um, again, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of these names being so, so generic because they are really confusing. You need to remember a lot of things on your mind. So I want to make them more specific. So instead of input data set, I'm going to uh, say user uh, data. Um, and we'll use that in a couple locations. Um, instead of summary, I'm going to say my uh, data summary and data table for instead of table. Um, so these are a little bit more specific um, than the ones we had before. Um, why am I doing that? So I don't want to get confused between uh, like input, originally was like input data set and we're creating an R object called data set, right? And I didn't want to get confused between the summary output and the summary function or the table output and whatever we're doing here. Um, so, um, uh, okay, so after that, uh, sidetracking a little bit, let's go back to what our server function has. So we already know that we want as an output something called data summary. And we specified on our user interface that that had to be text, right? Verbatim text. This is one of those that is a little bit confusing because there's not a render, render verbatim text. There's actually a function called render print, which is the one that is paired with verbatim text output. So We'll use that there. 
Then we also have a, a, an output called data underscore table, and we said that it was of the type table. Uh, so there's actually a function called then render table to create that, um, that table. So now we have our two uh, reactive functions from the shiny package, render print and render table. Both of them, we start them by opening parentheses and then up opening curly brackets. And now in both of them, we're gonna react to whatever the user does. And so in both of them, you can see that we're using input dollar sign user data, right? User data is the ID for our select input. Input ID. Um, and these were, this was output ID. Mm. Output ID. Right. Um, so in both of our render functions, we're reacting to whatever the, the user does on input, um, whenever they change input user data, right? Um, what are the things that we're doing? So in line number nine, we're using the base R function called get. This is a kind of a weird function, but this is when you have the name of an object um, stored inside of an object and you wanna access that object. There's a lot of um, gymnastics, but let's say if I, if my, my R session, I have um, the object Leo. Uh, and then I have another object called uh, object. I'm gonna say it's called the object Leo. Normally, if you're the user, you can just type Leo and print, right, the object. But using the function get, you can say, I want to get my object. And I get the same thing. I get the Leo object. So that's a little bit complicated. And we need to do this because how we're programming right now, we're not programming interactively. We're programming in a way that we're going to let this you know, run by itself. So that's why we're using this get function to get whatever data the user selected from the data sets package. Um, uh, from what, I mean, what available data sets we have in R. Um, so now that we have that data, in one case, we're gonna uh, do uh, a summary of, we're gonna run the summary function on that data. Um, and then in the other case, we're simply gonna print that data. So now that we have all those pieces, I can go back to run app, um, run my app, and now we see that the website is a bit more complicated because it's showing here the data set called ability.cov. It's showing the summary for it, which has like, um, that looks a little bit complicated here. So let me go and select, and um, let me search for, let's see, uh, oh, empty cars. This is another example data set that we use a lot. And so we can see on the summary now it shows actually a numerical summary for each of the, I think it's like um, eight, 11 columns that this data set has. MPG, seal, dispersion, I mean, not dispersion, but this, I don't, I don't remember what it stands for. Um, and then below it, it actually prints the full output as a table, all this data set. Um, and you know, this was pretty fast. Um, uh, it like, you know, um, it ran really fast, and that's because we're making something that's kind of simple, right? Um, but it's also because of how you know Shiny has been coded, and um, uh, this is a lot faster than us typing the code on our R console and like see, checking the output or remaking um, a new R markdown file after changing some parameters. Um, so, um, you know, that's a quick, um, uh, little shiny app where we select a data set and we, uh, we show some statistical summary information for it. And then we also see the actual data. Um, so, um, um, so this is what I was saying also that the render functions render, uh, and then the suffix uh, is um, um, one of the things that we'll 
normally we will be paired with the um, uh, with um, UI functions. Um, so there's a couple more options that we can have. Um, 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 like a lot of, you know, we can make the plot, the, the table in different ways. Now, the next thing that uh, Halley goes into is reducing code duplication. Why is that? Why do you want to do this? Well, you want to do this because uh, um, right now, our app, the way it's coded is that whenever the user changes the input uh, ID, we actually need to obtain that data in line number nine and also in line number 14. So we're obtaining that data twice. Um, and so uh, there's something a little bit, we can do something a little bit smarter than that. And we can just obtain the data once, react to the user input once instead of multiple times. And so in order to do that, we're gonna learn something new called the reactive function. So I'm gonna copy paste this, um, uh, well, yeah, I'll copy paste this. Uh, portion um, into my server function is no longer called input data set. I call it uh, user data. And uh, we can now simplify our code. We no longer need to obtain the data set. Uh, and in, whenever we were calling the data set, now it, you can notice that I, I'm using the function syntax in R. And that's because we're now using the reactive function from the Shiny package that, again, like the render functions, uses an open parenthesis, open curly brackets, and does something here that reacts to the user. But it is, this actually, the output of this reactive function is actually a function in itself. So that's why later on on line 13, um, I can't just call the data set object because it doesn't exist. I need to call the data set function here. Um, and that's basically the same thing that they have over here uh, uh, that Halley has on his website. So now if I uh, um, save it and run the app, um, I get the same thing. Right, I mean, from the user side, nothing really changed, and it's hard to notice um, what, whether it's faster or not. But um, once you have a, you know, you build a, a bigger and bigger shiny app, you want to minimize anything that takes a while to compute or to load. So, uh, using these reactors, that will be quite useful, um, and also your code is a lot simpler. So, if um, you want to change how you interact with whatever user data is, um, is specified. Uh, maybe, maybe instead of loading from the package data sets, now you're loading from another place. You only have to change uh, one line of code instead of multiple lines of code. Um, so um, that's like the introduction to Shiny. There's a cheat sheet that has a lot of more information about it. And um, we won't have, as much time anymore, but here are a couple of examples that um, I would encourage you to try on your own time. Um, you want to um, practice some of the, what I was mentioning about Shiny. Um, this is um, uh, uh, here, one of them is like, let's create an app that, um, that says hello to you um, based on your name. And they're giving you some of the pieces. So they're giving you some of the text input, render text. And you, the exercise here is really like copy pasting this piece of code and putting them into the structure that we had earlier on of um, the initial structure of our, um, um, this uh, shiny app structure that we had at the beginning. So it's like you copy this part then you copy pieces of, of the code that they give you further below in the exercise um, and make sure that you have them in the right place. Some of them go in the UI function, some of them go in the render in the server function. So that's that first exercise. The second exercise is, um, uh, is based on that histogram 
it's a similar idea to the history of one. Um, it says here, like, suppose your friend wants you to design an, an app that allows the user to set a number X between one and 50, and then displays the result of multiplying that number by five, right? So we have here, you know, X by five, and we're gonna print that on our rendered text. The problem is right now we have an error if we just run all this code. And so the idea is to find where is that error, right? And this really comes down to remembering how you interact with input and output. Um, so, I mean, that's a big hint, um, but, um, um, and it's also one of the reasons why we tell you to try to use uh, more specific means. Um, so that's, this one you can just copy paste and, uh, and then uh, look at the different X's and see what, what it's missing compared to what we did before. The third exercise is uh, using the same app. Now we want to multiply by, we want to do X by Y. And so this involves, um, you know, finding that we have a slider input and making a new one for Y. And then instead of having X times five, it's going to be X multiplied by five using the same solution that you have for um, the second exercise. And, um, and then there's a couple more, but I, um, um, I'll, I'll stop describing the exercises there. Um, because um, the other thing I wanted to show you is, um, or I mean, I just wanted to mention that um, Shiny is quite complicated, but what I recommend is that you just uh, try it out and make something simple at the beginning. Um, and so here I put some of my examples. This is actually something I made on uh, for my for my cousin, 2013. Um, 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 and if I if we go into this directory, you can find the my server and UI functions. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm, it was just a, um, it's not a very big app. Um, and that is like one of the first apps I made. Uh, another one that I made was um, for mortgage calculations. Um, my dad was wanted some numbers and um, I, I was like, oh, let me try it. Let's see if I can make an app. Um, so that's, this is emitted like seven years ago. Now, something I forgot to mention is that um, this last link uh, from shiny.rstudio is that once you make an app and you want to share it with the world, there's a couple options. But one of them is deploying to shinyapps.io, which is a service run by RStudio, where um, they run um, computers with R and make it easy for you to upload your Shiny apps there. And you can make a free account. And so this one is actually deployed on my free, my free personal account. Um, and so we can see this mortgage calculation app. Um, now, because it's free at some point, if a lot of people use it, then it stops working. <laughs> um, but um, we have uh, acquired at Libre uh, a Shiny apps account for the Institute. So if you make an app, uh, you can definitely um, uh, talk about how to deploy it to our um, Shiny uh, interface. Um, another one here is a, this one is one of the most complicated ones I did through my PhD, which was like a scheduler for Capstone TA sessions, which um, I won't go into that app. Um, then there's another like one for, um, that shows like um, uh, really, Really, this app is, has a couple panels, but it's showing you um, an interactive table here that you can search through. That's all this app is doing. Um, and once I made that app, later on, I was like, oh, maybe I can make something nicer. And so that's when I made um, this shiny CSV interface, which is like one where you can upload a text file, um, a table, and you can see the summary and make some plots. Um, um, it tries to make the best automatic plots for you uh, based on some input information. Um, and that structure, um, I was like, oh, maybe you people want to check how it looks. And so this shiny CSV dash showcase version of the shiny app is one where you see the app on the top, 
but on the bottom, I mean, right now I'm too zoomed in, but uh, it could be on the side. Uh, you can actually see here the actual code of how this app was made. Um, and whenever you interact with it, uh, it will highlight in, in yellow the lines of code that were just run. Um, 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 so this is actually a, a useful mode if you want to understand a bit more how things are working on your Shiny app. Um, and there's a bit of a more complicated app than before, um, but it's actually based on this recount app in a way. Um, um, and, um, and once I did that, at some point we had a, a specific data set called Recon Brain. And so I only adapted that, uh, that app for this particular data. So, uh, and this is actually the ty same type of app that we use for a uh, Libra phenotype table. So what I'm trying to mention here is that once you start and you make one of these apps, even if it's a small one, and, um, you can reuse a lot of that code later on for other apps that you're making. Um, and so, uh, like I've reused a lot of that code also, for example, for a more complicated app here that is, shows the results of a paper we made. Um, and this one takes a while to load because it has to load a lot of data on it. Um, and on my, the most recent example, which is the spatial LIBD app, right? Um, so, uh, that's the path that I've taken. Just, you know, build a small, simple app and then you can uh, reuse a lot of the code that you made for one app for the next apps. So here you can see I'm also showing an interactive table and that's because I learned in the past how to make one for an app that I only had one table and now it has a table and plots and other things, right? Um, and once, you know, I did that and then later on here, there's this more complicated app that does, um, and lets you download the figure and load data and do a lot of more other things. Um, so um, uh, you start building your like small like knowledge base of our, of shiny code. Later on, you can reuse that code and make one of these applications um, fairly fast. Um, so with that, I want to stop recording. If I can find me soon. Yeah. Yes.